Hello, everyone. Welcome so welcome to the evening webinar that we'll be hosting tonight for the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. Um, we're so happy that you're all able to join us this evening. We are um, very excited to highlight some of the impeccable speakers that we had at our most recent open houses um, in November. And I know some of you were unable to make it. So we're really, really happy to be able to offer you uh, the most salient points that we had uh, within our open house. Um, the regular forum of our open houses is most speakers will have one hour to an hour and a half of lecture time. Uh, this evening, we've taken um, all the amazing elements and brought it into half an hour uh, per each speaker. So we're just going to uh, wait two minutes. Right now, we have about uh, 16 people on with us. And we will just wait two minutes to allow uh, some more of the guests to come on, and then we'll continue. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. It's Julia. We've got about 30 on now. We're just going to wait a few more minutes. People just show up a couple minutes later. So if we wait another couple minutes, we'll populate a few more. Okay, before we get started. Fantastic. Thank you, Julia. Okay. Yeah. Catherine, I see that you're on. While we're waiting, can you tell me how many spaces are left? Okay, we'll answer your uh, questions uh, afterwards. We're just going to get started. So Elizabeth, if you want to also share that we'll do questions um, through the chat, and then we'll answer them afterwards, maybe a couple times as people come on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you, sorry, and you've got a thank you from Stephanie. Um, oh, you got a thank you from a few others here, so we can probably get uh, get going. Okay, awesome. That's right. So if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to just pop in your question in that chat area, and we will uh, try to answer them as we go along. Okay, I'm just going to uh, get my uh, slides up here. Just waiting it for it to uh, go full screen here. Okay, so everyone, welcome to the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. Uh, the Institute was founded in 1996, and it's been 24 uh, beautiful years servicing the most incredible souls that come through our doors. Uh, we have uh, an array of um, beautiful individuals that are inspired to take action within their own health shift and their own health paradigm of finding optimal health. Many of the students that come to IHN have healed themselves through nutrition, um, or they've seen too many loved ones pass away with diseases that were easily treatable and preventable through nutrition. So there's a real passion, a real drive, and a real motivating factor to uh, make nutrition a part of their life and a part of what they want to do for their career. We opened uh, the Mississauga campus, was founded in uh, 2006, which is in uh, Beautiful area, the square one. We opened the Vancouver campus in British Columbia in 2011. And it's been a spectacular eight years there. Um, there's a beautiful view of the mountains in the student lounge. And uh, it's been so wonderful to be in the West Coast. And we opened up our Ottawa campus in 2015 in the nation's capital. Again, in a beautiful area in Nepean, uh, lots of green space. And no matter which campus you attend, um, all of them have lots of natural light through the classroom windows and uh, have the same program that is offered at each campus. We also have quite a few students that are able to move through the different campuses if they move from province to province or would like to do some of their classes at, uh, at various campuses. So it is very flexible um, in that way. And we've actually had two graduates that have attended all four campuses and that was, uh, that was a great celebratory moment at convocation. So our program at IHN is a one-year full-time diploma program 
We have two entry points every January and September of each year, and it is completed over a one year period, Monday to Thursday from 10 o'clock to 2 p.m. There is a half an hour lunch break and most post-secondary college and university programs will have one course for one hour, three times a week. IHN's program is a very condensed two and a half year post-secondary condensed into one. So there's quite a bit of information covered. However, it is very doable and all of the principles that are required to make a successful certified nutritional practitioner qualified within this timeline uh, is very achievable and has been uh, a beautiful thing to see over these years of what our graduates are doing in the field. Our part-time program is geared to people that are working full-time and are unable to take a year off or do not have the flexibility to study during the day. So 90% of the students that study in the evening program work full-time. And this is done through two nights a week, Monday and Thursday evenings from six o'clock to 9.30. Um, or you can also study part-time during the day if you have flexibility in your daytime schedule. So we have quite a few entrepreneurs uh, that have flexible hours or also people that work full-time uh, but are also able to drop down to a part-time schedule in their work and study at IHN during the day part-time. So you can do Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to 2, and that's over approximately two and a half years. And as I mentioned, the part-time evening program is done over two years, and that's the Monday and Thursday evenings from 6 to 9.30. What really sets IHN apart is the fact that we are an in-class program. So when you have that interaction with your faculty members, when you really connect with people from all over the world and have that incredible connection of like-minded passions, um, you have incredible interper interpersonal relationships that get built, trusted partnerships, and a lot of the personal branding that happens in our industry really starts uh, within the classroom. And I tell everyone at orientation that your reputation in this field actually starts the moment you enter your class, um, because many of you will get into business together, you'll start incredible enterprises together, and you'll really foster lifelong relationships. Um, I know myself, I've been in the industry for over 30 years and students that and colleagues that I met in school, we still do things together. So there's no, I guess there's really no comparison to that, that um, core essence of face to face and really being in a, in a group of beautiful souls with like minded passions. And there's that invaluable support that comes from each other, just knowing that your colleague that you never met before is coming to school every single day and you've connected on some level you start to see that you really do it together and you really pull together as a group to um, get through all of your studies. There's also a huge amount of hands-on exposure that is occurring uh, within an in-class program such as ours and I will explain some of the benefits and uniqueness about our program. And there's access to the minds of the industry leading practitioners through our faculty and they are really what uh, make IHN's program as outstanding as it is. So there is a, a full team at every student's disposal as well through academic advising. We have guidance counseling as well. The faculty, the colleagues that they meet, all of the individuals that they're exposed to through our guest speakers, our continuing education courses, our evening workshops, and our weekend workshops as well. Upon graduation, graduates receive a Certified Nutritional Practitioner designation. And this is the designation that is exclusively earned by IHN graduates. The program consists of 19 different courses. Uh, for tonight's focus, we will be focusing on the courses that our three faculty uh, will be speaking on. 
If you can see uh, with the list on the screen here, we always like to cover the foundational principle courses of the sciences early on so that all the prerequisites are taken care of for courses such as symptomatology one and two, pathology, and then all the applied hands-on courses uh, in the latter half of the program. So our IHN faculty, are, uh, they're, they're truly world-renowned individuals and we're very blessed that many of our faculty are graduates of our program. The minimum requirement is that they're in the industry for a minimum of two years and that they're doing exceptionally well and are able to bring their wisdom from the industry into the classroom. So many of them teach for us while running very successful enterprises, clinical practices, and many other uh, businesses that they run or they are specialists in the area that they are teaching, i.e. they may be a cellular biologist if they're teaching our biological chemistry course, or a naturopathic doctor as well teaching pathology, all exceptionally trained in the area that, they're, that they are teaching. So for this evening, um, our first speaker will be Jennifer Papa Constantino, and she will be speaking on food allergies versus sensitivities differences and holistic applications for relief. So I will be going through a detailed biography of each speaker right before uh, they are going on this evening. The course that Jennifer will be highlighting will be symptomatology part one. So the prerequisite for this course is anatomy and physiology and this is really the first course where the students start to merge all that wonderful normal physiology and anatomy knowledge into the symptoms of the body, whether we're looking at deficiencies or excesses. They understand the clinical assessment of the nutritional status by interpreting the physiological symptoms and their relationships to nutritional deficiencies and excesses through a questionnaire called the NutriBody Questionnaire, which was founded by David Rowland and is a wonderful educational tool. It merges 650 different symptoms of the body and looks at the correlation of those symptoms. When graduates get into the field, they can also do practice in our student clinic. And we have a very streamlined approach to the questionnaire that is used when they're in practice. However, for teaching purposes, the questionnaire of the NutriBody um, is exceptionally thorough. It really illustrates the interrelationships that exist between the nutrients and how these play a critical role in determining optimal health and nutritional requirements. So within this course, the students are evaluated on case study approaches and the very first case study they do is themselves. So a wonderful component of the program is that every student heals themselves before they're able to move on and heal others. Essential principles of biochemical individuality are also highlighted in this course, and this is one of the main um, critical aspects of becoming a holistic nutritionist is focusing and understanding and really breaking down an individual's biochemical individuality, what works for that individual based on pre and inherent genetic weaknesses, metabolic profiling, Ayurvedic body types, a 24-hour recall, blood types, and putting that all together for a very succinct and detailed protocol based on that individual's lifestyle, how long they have been suffering from certain symptoms or disease states, and moving them towards that optimal health that they are looking for. In this course, you are determining optimal nutritional requirements that are specific to the deficiencies and toxicities that are seen within each client um, that is focused on in that topic. Our second speaker, Paul Demita, will be highlighting optimal health through optimal nutrition. That's our preventive healthcare course. The preventive healthcare course will cover how nutrition can protect against, reverse, and or delay many ailments, including some of the most common diseases that you will see as a graduating certified nutritional practitioner, including osteoporosis, diabetes, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, arthritis, cancer, anemia, kidney disease, mental conditions such as Alzheimer's and dementia, and also certain cancers, including colon, et cetera. 
The current research developments on photochemical antioxidants and nutraceuticals are also explored in this course. Our third speaker, Jamie Lynn Shaw, will be highlighting the comparative diets course. She'll be discussing the elusive perfect diet factor myth. Our comparative diets course covers holistic principles of food dynamics and their application for optimal health and well being. So it's a wonderful exploration of over 24 different diet approaches, the pros and cons of each one, the benefits, limitations of all the various common and uncommon diet approaches that you might see. Every week, one of the top 10 bestseller lists will always have a diet book. The thirst for nutritional knowledge out there is unquenchable and people always want to try a different approach. So this is a fantastic course to really look at all these types of different diets and which part of the population that they are geared towards. We also cover cleansing and detoxing diets for caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine detox in this course as well. So all the popular diets, uh, some of them, we discuss low fat diets, high protein diets, the glycemic index and longevity diets, it also covers some of the popular ones today, the Paleolithic, the Ketogenic, the Rainbow Diet, plant-based diet approaches, veganism, etc. It is a really uh, great way to start critically evaluating the different diets, and it's a, a fantastic way to see what the commonalities are within each one of these diets, and then where the individual researcher has chosen to tweak whether they're looking at the macronutrient ratio or the micronutrients within a specific diet or focusing on one specific aspect, let's say it's increasing fats. It's always a, a very exciting exploration of all of these principles and breaking those down. One of the main benefits of IHN's program is the hands-on experience that you receive throughout the one or two year program. Within our Nutrition in the Environment course, there is a field trip that all the students do. They go to an organic farm with the instructor and all of their classmates, and they're able to participate in organic and dynamic farming and see exactly how these farms are run and really get their hands right in the soil. And many of the students who had very little interest in this topic and thought they would get into maybe consulting when they first came to the school after taking the environment course, become so empowered with healing the earth and just working with the soil that many of them choose this as their co-op and then end up doing it for a living. Another incredible aspect of the program is the holistic food preparation course. It's wonderful to learn all the different theories and applications of nutrition, but when you're trying to heal people through food, you really have to get into their kitchen and really see how are people preparing food? How is the food, the composition of the food being altered through the preparation? And this is a great way uh, to get right into the kitchen and learn a lot of holistic principles of fermenting and soaking, sprouting, a lot of juicing. And there are three classes that you do together. Um, you're fully fed breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They're completely vegan. And the instructors are just incredible. In Ontario, the classes are done within the instructor's home. And at our Vancouver campus, the classes are run right on campus with the facilitator of the uh, holistic food preparation course. So we have five to six students and one instructor. Everyone is able to get involved and really learn about the beautiful feeling of food in their hands how much power they hold right in their kitchens. And uh, I've also heard many students say that after taking the holistic food preparation class, uh, they just don't eat out as much as often because they're just so excited to get into their own kitchens again and help their clients as well. So it uh, is a really, really amazing way to get into the food. Also the herb walk that we offer through the herbal medicine course, the students are able to experience herbs right in their natural habitat. So we take all the students with the herbal medicine instructors at all four campuses to the nearest farm. It doesn't have to be a farm. A lot of it is um, 
a very large vast green space or a park a lot of, it can be a conservation area but it can also be um, you're taught to identify herbs that are just right in your backyard or even if you live in an apartment dwelling uh, just going to your local park and seeing what exactly is around you and a whole new world opens up to you so identifying different herbs learning to in this course you also learn how to make tinctures salves a lot of skin uh, natural products that you can use just from ingredients within your kitchen. So identifying them through a walk, um, it's a full day out and again very empowering and uh, very very inspiring to learn this knowledge. In December we still have one week to go uh, that we have classes running. So if you're in the area of any of our four campuses you're more than welcome to come and join us to be a student for a day. Uh, this will give you an opportunity if you weren't able to attend our, our open house, you can come and sit in on a class, meet our students and have a discussion with the instructors as well and really get to feel uh, the vibe and culture at IHN. Uh, so we'd be happy to uh, book you in if you're interested in doing that. Um, we also have uh, incredible guest lectures that we bring um, as a registered student at IHN, you are exposed to uh, weekly guest lectures, and these are at two o'clock at all campuses. Um, we either do the weekly or bi-monthly. We have graduates that come back so you can get to see how well they're doing in the field. We have authors of books on our list that come back and an exceptional list of various guest speakers that we bring in. Uh, the students love these. They always run from 2 to 3.30. They're additional uh, information on top of the regular curriculum that you'll be learning. And uh, it's almost like an additional three hours of material sometimes. And they're so generous. They always come with giveaways, uh, wonderful PowerPoint presentations. And again, it's another way of increasing your reach with networking, seeing what is out there. And, trying that if, it, if it's a potential co-op that comes up or if it's an area that you wanted to uh, get into, you could connect with that guest speaker and see how you can work together. Um, so these are, uh, here's an example. This one was in Vancouver. We had our graduate Antonina Berachenko. She came in and spoke on neuroendocrinology and natural approaches to mental health. Uh, Antonina is an exceptional graduate and also is on faculty at the Vancouver campus as well. She teaches the preventive healthcare course. That's an example of one of the guest speakers. We also have the most extensive uh, continuing education department and we're so happy to open our doors to graduates from all uh, nutrition programs that are offered throughout uh, Canada, the United States and all over the world. We have uh, courses that are above and beyond uh, the program. So if someone would like to specialize in herbal medicine, for example, we have advanced herbal research methodologies. We have courses in energy medicine. We do live blood cell demonstrations at our open houses. And uh, just one minute, I'll be right back. Hi. Okay, so some of the continuing education courses that we offer, we add new ones on every year and for 2020, uh, we're excited to add five new additional courses onto the roster. These are very easy to fit into your schedule. They are one night a week. And most of the graduates uh, we find that regularly meet their 30 hours a year of upgrading uh, do exceptionally well in the field because the Continuing education courses are a way of always empowering yourself with updated information, keeping abreast of the trends that are in holistic nutrition. One of the examples of our continuing education courses is Understanding Genetics for Improving Health Outcomes that we ran uh, with Dr. Raul. And this is uh, again, a way to 
really see what is hot in, in the research of holistic nutrition at the moment, orthomolecular medicine, and also functional medicine. So these are all listed on our website under our continuing education link. If you are a part of our list, we'd be happy to um, add you on if you are not on our list and you can always have a, an email of what our next upcoming continuing education courses are. We also are so happy to offer weekend workshops. Uh, this one we offered at our Mississauga campus and this was on sacred geometry exploring hidden symbols of the universe. And these are two to three day workshops that we offer. Again, open to all graduates of IHN and other practitioners within the healthcare industry. Another one we ran was uh, plant medicine with cannabis with uh, Dr. Sean. This was a very successful evening workshop that we ran and we will be running a full Con Ed course with Dr. Sean as well, as far as edibles and medicinal cannabis research protocols and applications. The other item uh, in regards to the Institute of Holistic Nutrition's program that is really poignant and very unique is the co-op experience. So. The co-op, or in uh, British Columbia, it is called WE, which is the Work Experience Education. It's similar to a university model and a degree program requirement. It's a complement to advance the formal education and foundation that the students learn within the program and allows them to balance out the theory and practice by getting actual hands-on experience within the industry. We have an exceptional co-op and WE department at each campus that works individually with every student and allows a three-way partnership among the institute, the student, and the co-op partner. It is part of IHN's program. It is 140 hours in the industry and the student can break that up and do multiple co-ops uh, within that 140 hours. We're also so blessed every year we see graduates that will do even longer, we've had a graduate that did almost 350 co-op hours um, and she just thoroughly enjoyed all of her experiences and she's doing uh, exceptionally well in the industry now and opened up um, a herb farm. We have IHN that develops co-ops and we's based on current relevant and growing areas, personally applicable opportunities in the natural health industries the co-op and WEs are sent out via email bi-weekly to all current students at IHN as they are developed and applied to by graduating students individually. Students are asked and are open to consulting with the co-op and WE department when seeking areas of specific interest at any time throughout our program. The IHN work experience advantage allows the, the students to have an ability to secure a variety of experiences and co-ops in and around the GTA and across Canada and also around the world. It enhances career opportunities after graduation. So we send regular co-op and job opportunities every month, the 1st and 15th, to all registered and current students. If you're interested in seeing what our graduates are doing on our website, we have IHN alumni profiles link that you can look at and really see the vast array and variety of, and exceptional graduates that are out there in the industry. I would like to introduce our first speaker, which is, we have Jennifer Papa Constantino. Okay. Jennifer uh, is an exceptional practitioner. Jennifer graduated from the Institute of Holistic Nutrition in 2008. She participated in a mentorship program studying the philosophies and teachings of Dr. Bernard Jensen, as well as completing certification courses in clinical iridology, live blood cell microscopy, and BASE allergy therapy. She is an energetic, dynamic, and exceptional nutritional practitioner. She is the founder of Heal Naturally Holistic Health, a nutritional consulting practice which offers complementary therapies and evidence-based clinical nutrition which harmonizes the beliefs and practices of a balanced approach to lifelong health. 
she decided to pursue her own passion for health and become an educator after successfully experiencing firsthand the profound effects of improved diet and lifestyle with her own family. She is a mother of four and completed IHN's program in the evening while running a wonderful business uh, and managing her four children and her very busy life. Jennifer teaches nutritional symptomatology part one. She teaches nutrition through the lifespan, comparative diets, and she runs a very busy and successful practice in the East End. And let's welcome Jennifer. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, beginning. Okay. Um, welcome to IHN's uh, webinar. Uh, for those of you who uh, were unable to come to our open house, um, we're glad to have you online. And uh, I'm just going to put my headphones in and keep it, trying to keep background noise out. Um, so there's uh, my name. So I'm a, a graduate of the part-time evening program very proudly. Um, and I, I do practice uh, clinical nutrition where I've taken my training at IHN and I brought it into a clinical setting. Um, you know, Elizabeth mentioned that we've gone on to do some other great things in the industry. So, uh, uh, you know, um, my education didn't stop there. I studied iridology. Um, I offered live blood cell analysis, also known as dark field microscopy. Um, I, I trained with Dr. Robert Marshall in the United States, as well as Dr. Dietrich Klingart, uh, and very honorably, um, you know, live on. Uh, especially Dr. Robert Marshall, his legacy uh, using QRA. I've also uh, taken all of uh, Sir Royal's continuing medical education courses and uh, very proudly um, own the title of a biotherapeutic drainage certificate um, through their medical education seminar. So welcome to our webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about food allergies and uh, sensitivities. Um, we're going to talk about what the difference is and a holistic approach to relief um, if you suffer from these. Uh, this is an excerpt from the course uh, that I have been teaching for about 10 years called Symptomatology Part 1. Um, in this course, we do bring in uh, uh, the clinical component of nutrition where we take it way beyond theory and we make it applicable to the client. So it's a very exciting course for the students. They love um, no, knowing, you know, what to do and how to help someone or how to help themselves uh, by using some clinical protocols, uh, especially really taking it into that unique biochemistry, um, you know, because one nutrient is not right for everybody or one protocol. Uh, so uh, this is a quote from one of our uh, textbooks uh, that we use in the course lifespan, which I've also uh, taught for the last four years. And uh, the greatest challenge with allergy is recognizing it. Uh, this is a book uh, in our curriculum called Allergies, a Disease in Disguise. Um, I do have to tell you, I was so thrilled as a student to uh, pick up this book and have it in the curriculum. I read it twice. Um, I had a, a son who was uh, uh, had some very unique uh, food sensitivities that uh, we undercovered. I'll talk about how. And unfortunately, um, this book uh, saved his life. Um, he was in kindergarten when his teacher very surprisingly and shockingly came to us. Uh, my husband and I called a meeting and said uh, uh, that she believes that our son had some type of learning disability. Uh, it turned out that he had uh, hearing loss and some really bad inflammation. And so this uh, whole segment that I'm talking about was really relevant to him. Anyway, um, when we uh, turned our, uh, his diet around, and I mean, at this time he was gluten-free, wheat-free, dairy-free already, you know, but uh, we'll talk about what his allergy was uh, in a few minutes. But when we took out the specific foods that he was reacting to, you know, his teacher called another meeting and she said, you know, I know you and your husband are into some natural type stuff. I'm not sure what it is. But she said, I've seen a 363 as 360 degree turnaround in your son. And I'm just going to tell you as his teacher to just keep going. So, you know, it's, it's been instances like this that kind of light a fire under our rear end to just 
you know, just keep swimming as uh, Nemo would say, or Dory. Uh, so onwards and upwards. Um, now, uh, just to set the record straight here, when I talk about food allergy, food intolerance or food sensitivity, what those definitions are. Um, so a food allergy, uh, when we talk about the term allergy, um, what you need to understand is that um, an allergy always or involves the immune system. Uh, more specifically, something called immunoglobulin E. So you see an abbreviation there, IgE. Uh, and this can be identified through blood work. Uh, it is a reaction to a food or some type of substance. And just to set the record straight, you can only be allergic to a protein. So dander from a pet is a protein, pollen from a plant is a protein, and only proteins can elicit a true, true allergic response, okay? Um, and so when we discuss symptoms of allergies, these are, you know, common for those of you who may suffer from allergies. What you're going to see is, you know, itchy eyes, watery nose, runny nose, hives, uh, you know, histamine type of reactions. Obviously, the, the worst case scenario is anaphylaxis. Uh, but maybe even like swollen gums, swollen tongue, itchy, you know, um, and red eyes, things like that. So it usually involves uh, some type of inflammatory immune response, uh, such as histamine or leukotrienes or cytokines, things like that. Um, when we talk about food intolerances and food sensitivity, I'm going to use those interchangeably, actually. Um, so it's any other adverse reaction to a food in which uh, the immune system involvement is generally unproven. So typically, um, you can be sensitive or intolerant to any component of a food. Um, typically, the immune system may or may not be involved in here. So you may not see like, you know, red eyes or hives or swollen, you know, this, that or the other. Um, but it could be, it could show up as high blood pressure for some people. It could show up as uh, Crohn's or colitis or IBS for some people. Uh, it could show up as you know anything weird like a learning disability, dys dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, you know behavioral issues, things like that. So, and then food sensitivity—that's a common catch-all term used for any type of food allergy or food intolerance. Um, now, in terms of like food intolerances, you can actually be intolerant to any component of a food. It doesn't necessarily have to be the protein. And um, uh, for food intolerance, uh, any symptom can show up. So just to set the record straight, when I use the fruit word allergy, we're talking about like a true immune response. When I'm using the term intolerance or sensitivity, I'm going to use those interchangeably. So uh, the difference between uh, food allergies and sensitivities, uh, some of the things I already discussed here, the uh, allergies and immune response to specifically a protein. Um, and this could be food and environmental substances such as like pet dander and, you know, dust and, and uh, pollen or, or venom or, you know, from like a bee sting or something like that. The re response typically to an allergy is immediate. Um, delayed allergies uh, are less common but uh, still plausible. And they can start anywhere in the body. So this could be the skin, you know, the nose, the eyes, whatever. Um, now, sensitivity or intolerance, uh, what happens here is this is a dis de decreased enzyme in a particular food. So more so an intolerance or a sensitivity is the inability to digest or metabolize or clear a, a particular component of a food. Um, so typically it has more to do with like an enzyme system or a pathway in the liver uh, so, for instance, uh, if somebody feels like they're allergic to garlic and, you know, maybe garlic just, you know, causes them like really bad reflux or, um, you know, GERD, heartburn, uh, or the garlic actually causes, you know, them to have chronic diarrhea or things like that, that's not an allergy, okay? That is more of a, a sensitivity, but again, in the industry, a lot of people, they don't know the difference. So they just, you know, they, they say, I'm allergic to garlic, but that's not really what's happening from a biochemical standpoint or a physiological standpoint. Um, for food sensitivities, uh, the response can be immediate. So you may see it, or it may be delayed up to 72 hours. And sometimes these things, uh, this issue is really hard to pinpoint for a lot of people because 
Um, even if you're doing a food journal and you're writing all your foods down and you're trying to pinpoint, let's just say you do, you do have a sensitivity to garlic, you're kind of unaware of it. You consume garlic, but then two days later, you go to the movies and you eat popcorn and you have a reaction. And then you're thinking, obviously, you know, oh my gosh, it was the popcorn. Um, I'm not quite sure who actually can digest that movie popcorn, but that's another uh, webinar um, on digestion. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, this response can be delayed up to 72 hours. And so your thought process is, well, you know, it must be the popcorn. So you eliminate popcorn, but you did not suspect the garlic because that's something you maybe consumed, you know, the day before or two days ago or three days ago. And, uh, you know, you're thinking more of an immediate and you remove popcorn and your issues don't go away because, you know, you're still consuming garlic. You had no clue. Uh, so we're going to talk about strategies on how to determine, um, you know, food sensitivities. Uh, usually they start in the GI tract uh, and there may be some liver involvement as well. So common allergy symptoms. Uh, a lot of you are obviously aware of some of these. So, you know, skin contact, this could be poison oak, poison ivy. And uh, just to let you know um, that not everybody who goes in the forest and comes into contact with poison oak or poison ivy actually gets an infec infection or issues on their skin. So you actually can only contract poison ivy or poison oak if you are allergic to it or if you have some pre-existing uh, immune condition. Um, so uh, obviously bee sting, injection, um, medications, nuts and shellfish, you know, exposures. So what you're going to see is the typical sneezing, nasal congestion, post-nasal drip type things, uh, instant watery eyes, runny nose, needing to blow your nose, skin rash, hives, things like that. So typically allergies are more quite easier to pinpoint than the food sensitivities. Now, um, some other signs and symptoms that you may not be aware of that are a little less uh, um, obvious uh, to those who have not studied this discipline, um, dark circles under the eyes, uh, a term for this is called the allergic shiner. Um, and I tell you, when, uh, uh, as a mother of four, when uh, my kids were young, I could tell you right off the bat when they ate something that they weren't supposed to because they actually would get this little kind of like bruising, a little bit of purple under their eyes. And I always used to say, where'd you go? What'd you eat? You know, and they'd be like, oh, how'd she know? Uh, so it was kind of uh, something that would happen. It would last a couple of days. And then, you know, if, as long as they ate clean, it would go away. Um, especially for children, uh, slap cheek uh, or red ears. Uh, so the earlobes, the ears go red, the cheeks go red. Um, headache, you know, so a lot of people think headache, uh, I can assure you it's not an Advil or aspirin deficiency. Uh, it is a, a sign that the body is trying to tell you something. Um, aggression and lack of alertness, so mood changes, uh, behavioral changes, um, you know, ADD, ADHD can show up like that. Um, brain fog, um, molted tongue. Uh, so this is, we call this a geographic tongue. Um, technically, uh, typically what you'll see is that if you can stick out someone's tongue, you can see like maps of, you know, Madagascar and the Italian boot and things like that. That's called a modeled tongue. And uh, that could be a sign of food allergies. Uh, typically, a tongue is an extension of uh, the intestinal tract, so you can actually tell a lot. Uh, in our course Ayurveda, uh, we have um, uh, uh, you learn a, a little bit of tongue diagnosis, and we have a little bit of that in the course text there. Uh, rubbing of the nose or crease in the nose, so you actually uh, end up with a permanent little uh, crease around here. Uh, in kids, it looks really cute, but Unfortunately, that is a symptom of uh, chronic food uh, sensitivities and, and allergies. Uh, typically, with somebody who's allergic, they're going like this a lot. Okay, they're just going like this. And so what happens is they end up with a crease in the nose. Um, anxiety, rapid heart rate, so affecting blood pressure, abdominal pain and cramps. This can affect digestion, uh, itching and burning skin and congestion and sneezing, sneezing and asthma. So... Um, now, there are like diagnosable conditions where, you know, you get diagnosed with these things, but what's the root of the issue? Where is it coming from? Why do you have it? Uh, that's kind of where the medical system falls short, unfortunately, and the holistic practices come in. So uh, food sensitivities or food allergies can show up uh, GI disturbances. So Crohn's colitis, uh, IBSC, IBSD, 
uh, or malabsorption, uh, malabsorptive type issues, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like the term we use is leaky gut. Uh, the medical term is malabsorptive syndrome. It means the same thing, you know, just fancy terminology. Uh, the immune system, you may see chronic infection, uh, uh, sickness, you know, uh, those people kind of like they feel sick, but they don't get sick. Maybe a cold coming on all the time, but then they don't get a full-blown cold. They can't figure it out. Uh, mental state, uh, confusion, depression, hyperactivity in children, ADD, ADHD, uh, you know, dyslexia, getting things backwards. Um, respiratory, asthma, and bronchitis. So, you know, uh, the lungs in traditional Chinese medicine are a backup system to the gut. And typically, if something's going to affect the gut, like a chronic exposure to a food that you're unaware of that is causing a problem, the lungs can, you know, go into spasms and, and, and be affected by this as well. Uh, obviously, the skin and cardiovascular. So, actually, a very common cause of uh, low grade hypertension or high blood pressure is a uh, food allergy or food sensitivity. Um, what is the mechanism is that uh, when you're exposed to uh, a substance or a food that you're, you're sensitive to, it actually causes like a, a euphorbic or hyper response in the body. So we're going to talk about something called the Coca pulse test, uh, where you can measure your heart rate to determine if there is actually a food sensitivity over a period of time. And what happens is you get, kind of get like this food gasm. So there's also a saying amongst uh, holistic uh, nutritionists that you always crave your poison. So you always want to look at something that somebody's commonly consuming or can't live without. Um, typically, that is a food that they're craving their poison and it's causing this euphorbic response. And, you know, heart rate, heart rate goes up, um, blood pressure goes up, and, I, you know, it's, it's just this you know, hyperactive uh, response of the body. Arrhythmias, so this is a regular heartbeat. Um, for children, uh, this shows up just a little bit differently. So colic um, in a baby. Now, obviously, if a child's bre exclusively breastfed, you want to look at what the mom is eating. So typically, I, I'll do like a food sensitivity panel on the mom or an el elimination diet on the mom. Obviously, we're going to uh, eliminate common allergies first, which we'll talk about. Um, ear infections and bedwetting past the age of two and a half, three would be the absolute cutoff. Uh, age three, if there's a bedwetting and they just can't get to the toilet, what's happening is that hyper response that I talked about is affecting the bladder and possibly the kidneys as well. Um, eczema, asthma, and hyperactivity. Uh, so again, behavioral related type of stuff with kids. Okay, um, let's talk about how it affects digestion or how digestion affects allergies or vice versa. Um, and so this is a, a very complex uh, picture um, of the intestinal tract. Um, for those of you who kind of want a copy of uh, this slide, um, you, uh, I'll open up, uh, if you want to send me an email through my website at Heal Naturally, I can send you this particular slide here. Um, you will get this in lifespan. Um, so this is a little bit of expert of lifespan, and we talk about this quite extensively uh, in symptomatology as well. We do entire digestive protocols in Simplin. Uh, so what happens with this leaky gut type picture here is um, these undigested food complexes, uh, particular proteins are, um, you know, a big no-no. You don't want this to happen. So you have to understand when you eat a piece of chicken, um, your body has to break that chicken down. So first it breaks it down into polypeptides. So this is like uh, long chain proteins. And then the digestive system, um, you know, along with the stomach is supposed to break it down to like tripeptides and dipeptides. And then a single protein is called an amino acid. An amino acid is allowed to enter the bloodstream, but a long chain protein should not. And when the uh, intestinal tract, the integrity has been compromised, by you know maybe chronic gluten exposure, maybe yeast fungus parasites, um, maybe stress related antibiotic use, things like that. Uh, there's numerous or a multiplicity of reasons why th this can occur. Um, what's going to happen is uh, these food proteins and uh, longer food complexes will leak into the body, and the immune system is going to specifically tag proteins and start for forming um, the secretory um, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin E, and um, they're going to actually tag these 
um, kind of unidentified type of uh, weird proteins that the body doesn't actually recognize. So it, it wouldn't do this to an amino acid. It's only going to do this to a longer chain. And uh, so, you know, repeated, repetitive exposure, chronic exposure, and the um, uh, intestinal permeability as these things get worse. You know, the first time you eat gluten, no big deal. You continue to eat gluten. You start to react, but only once in a while. And then, like, next thing you know, you're full-blown, like, celiac, as an example, okay? So um, you have to be, like, there's a, a really uh, big component with gut involvement in this. And, uh, you know, we focus a lot of, of uh, healing and um, learning about gut issues uh, within the IHN curriculum. So what happens with an allergic response is the immune system is going to react by releasing, releasing cells called antibodies. Um, and these foods that cause and release the antibodies are called allergens or antigens. Two common antibodies released during a reaction to food are, consider, are called IgE or immunoglobulin E and IgG. Um, and so there are some really great food panels that holistic nutritionists can offer um, that can actually test for IgG or IgE in the blood or both. Um, to determine uh, hidden food sensitivities or food intolerances. And uh, so uh, I'll, I have a, a slide on this as well. So a food allergy can, is an immediate reaction and more likely it is uh, immunoglobulin E that's going to be um, secreted and going to be the culprit here causing the reaction. But the food sensitivity or food intolerance is a delayed reaction and it's caused by the production of immunoglobulin G, okay? And this is antibodies to a specific food. So some uh, uh, involvement here in antibodies, so these are called, uh, these gamma globulins are called immunoglobulins. IgE is synthesized by something called plasma cells. And uh, this is located primarily right under the mucosal surface. When I say mucosal surface, uh, this could be uh, located in the nasal cavity, uh, in the eyes, it's mucosal, uh, obviously the intestine, the throat is mucosal as well, okay, and the respiratory system, lungs as, as well. So this is why there may be, uh, you know, an allergic type of reaction affecting the lungs or the asthma or closing of the throat. So IgG is a little bit different. Uh, the second, third bullet there, it's produced by the lymphocytes. So these are a specific type of white blood cells. Uh, in the immune, uh, in the, uh, immune system, uh, a lymphocyte is more like a seek and destroy type of missile. Uh, so what these things do is they attack and destroy uh, bacteria. And then uh, uh, secretory IgA or immunoglobulin A, uh, the, this is a major role is to defend against foreign substances before they can enter the body. So we find a lot of uh, IgA or immunoglobulin A's in the saliva in our tears, um, you know, in, in the secretions of the eye, as well as the bloodstream and the lining of the digestive tract. So they look at uh, secretory IgA um, for, uh, they'll test for it medically for like Crohn's colitis, um, IBS typically, that's not one of the tests that they do, but uh, if it's bad enough. So where are some of these allergies that are coming from? So we're, uh, picture the body like a rain barrel and we're all born with our own like different size barrel and this size of the barrel is dependent on our parents um, and our grandparents and their exposure to chronic everyday toxins, medications, drug residues, what type of water they drank, the amount of stress, uh, how many vaccines they were exposed to, you know, where they live. Typically in Southern Ontario, it's more polluted. And if you live in Northern Ontario, uh, for those of you who don't live in Ontario, you know, and you live in BC, I'm sure like the bigger cities like Vancouver, uh, you know, there's way more pollution than, you know, if you live up in uh, Kelowna or somewhere, you know, where there's more trees, more air, things like that. So uh, we're looking at total load. So this includes environment, stress, diet, genetics, chemical exposure, drug exposure, vaccines, chronic infection, and lifestyle. And basically what happens is if, uh, if your barrel is full, then you're going to start spilling over. And when you spill over, that's when you're going to see a manifestation of symptoms. Um, and allergies can be one of those symptoms. You know, it's not always going to show up in an allergy. For some people, it may show up as like cysts or tumors. For some people, it may show up as, uh, you know, you start blowing holes in the body, so eczema, psoriasis type symptoms. But, uh, you know, allergies do play a role and your exposure to allergies as well. 
So for those of you who may uh, you know, have a bee sting allergy, the first time you got stung, not a big deal. Second time you got stung, you had a mild reaction, lasted a couple of days. Third time you got stung, your tongue swole up. Now you have to go to the doctor and you have to carry an EpiPen, right? So this has to do with that barrel effect. Um, some other contributing factors to so some of the things that we've talked about. Um, going back to childhood, um, introducing solid foods too early and what types of foods. Okay, so that's very specific. So I told you the story about my son. He was colic. And, um, you know, one of his top allergens, or actually his top allergen, was rice. And I do have to tell you, back in the day, when you were gluten-free and you were wheat-free and you were dairy-free, there was a lot of rice-based products. You know, we were having rice pasta and you were having, you know, rice-based bread and things like that. Um, I've learned to do rotational diets since that uh, time. Um, that's some of the things I learned at IHN. I've implemented a lot of these strategies. Um, back then, I was just a mom trying to make her way through, you know, all of the information that was available. Um, so introduction to solid foods too early. Well, guess what? Guess what Health Canada said was the best way to feed your baby? Uh, rice cereal, right? Because it's hypoallergenic. Uh, that was a big no-no for me, unfortunately. And I think that that was to his detriment. So poor digestion, any part of the digestive train, chain that's broken um, or malabsorption, dysbiosis. So dysbiosis is a term that basically just says that uh, the bacteria in your gut that are supposed to be in there are out of balance. So you maybe have more of the bad guys, not enough of the good guys. Uh, leaky gut, which we talked about. Uh, repetitive consumption of a known allergen uh, food. Uh, such as casein or grains or dairy. So, you know, the more you consume a food, the more often you consume a food, uh, you know, um, the more propensity you're going to have to have some type of uh, sensitivity or enzyme deficiency to it. Uh, bacteria and parasites are also um, an issue. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to skip ahead uh, to some strategies here. Um, so, oh, so, so for some diagnostic uh, testing for allergies, um, obviously there's the catch-all uh, skin test that's offered by the medical system, which unfortunately accounts for about less than 10 to 15% of like uh, the allergic response. Um, so as holistic practitioners, we have the ability uh, once you graduate to open um, lab panels and lab diagnostics. So we can run something called the ELISA test, it stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, um, ACT and IG, IgG test. Um, so this would be uh, taking a drop of blood, sending it off to an accredited lab, and them um, to test for different food panels or different size food panels. You can do a 90 panel, 100, you know, 150 panel, 220 foods, uh, depending on you know the variety of your diet. Um, there's something called the uh, RAS test or the RMAFST. Um, so this is a great test as well. Um, ALCAT test, uh, I'll let you take a look at that online. It's kind of like the new gold standard for uh, food sensitivity and allergy testing. Uh, you could do something called uh, elimination where, you know, it's cheap, but it takes a long time and you have to be quite disciplined about it, keeping a food journal, eliminating your suspect foods and then adding them back. You always want to do a challenge about three weeks later. And then you can use something called applied kinesiology or muscle testing. So I had introduced you at the beginning to uh, something that I do in clinic called QRA or ART. Uh, both of these are, and just one second, Elizabeth. Uh, so some uh, really good strategies, uh, nutritional strategies that we can offer. Um, obviously you wanna do some foundational type of stuff like a good high quality um, orthomolecular multivitamin and a B complex, but uh, you know, for those of you who have digestive issues with this, uh, vitamin C, I know Paul, Paul Demita is going to talk uh, about vitamin C today. So you look forward to that. And um, orthomolecular okay. dosing. Thank yeah. you so much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. Yeah, and Jennifer, you're teaching next week, right? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be on campus uh, Tuesday and Thursday to start session one and two of symptomatology part one, which we'll finish again in the new year. Fantastic. So if anyone's interested in being a student for a day at the uh, Toronto campus and want to sit in on one of Jennifer's classes, please uh, let us know and we'd love to set that up for you. Oh, Thank I'd you love so to much, see you Jennifer. all there. I'd like to see you there for a student for a day. That would be great. Fantastic. Okay. We'd like to introduce our, our next uh, faculty member, Paul Demita.
Paul graduated from the Institute of Holistic Nutrition almost 15 years ago, and since then he has been running uh, two incredibly successful nutritional practices. He runs the Dabinyan Digestive Healthcare Center Clinic and also the Wellness Institute in Toronto and in the Mississauga area. Paul is very passionate about empowering people to consciously and holistically manage their health. He is dedicated to investigating, clarifying, and explaining important nutrition issues and concepts, and is very passionate about critical thinking in the context of health nutrition and published research. Uh, we've been blessed to have Paul as a faculty member for over a decade, where he has taught advanced nutritional research, fundamentals of nutrition, preventative health care. He also teaches in our continuing education department, the clinical detoxification course, orthomolecular highlights. And Paul has taught pretty much at every campus at IHN. He helped us at the very first open house in Ottawa. He was the first speaker. He also teaches in our continuing education department at our Vancouver campus every year. And he teaches uh, at the Toronto and Mississauga campus. He is uh, very well loved. And we are very happy to have Paul Demita. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, I'm excited to uh, do this talk here. I do love the uh, whole uh, optimal nutrition and uh, the role of vitamins and minerals and food. So I'm going to start my screen and then we can get started. All right. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about optimal health through optimal nutrition today. And uh, I'm going to start with the question, what is optimal health? Because it is kind of nebulous. Everybody talks about it, but uh, what is it? It, uh, well, from uh, our perspective, the holistic perspective, there is no such thing as optimal health because that's perfection and all you need to do is breathe in some auto exhaust one day and you're slightly off of perfection. So we look at health as a continuum and so on the high end you have as close as you can get to perfect and on the low end you get death. And so everybody is somewhere on that continuum. Uh, the medical definition of optimal health is uh, anything that uh, is a situation where you do not see overt symptoms of disease. So it's way at the far end, it's closer to death, that's where you start to see things because the body is very resilient, it's very good at handling things, but uh, eventually things going bad start to show. And so uh, that's where it shows up for medicine. Uh, when uh, people start to regress so they go from optimal down towards the uh, the death end of the spectrum what's happening is the systems in the body are starting to become more and more chaotic and so one system is going to impact another which is going to impact another and you have this gradual or sometimes rapid progression to uh, um, total chaos. Uh, when you go the other way, basically what happens is the body progresses towards coherence, and coherence is like one and one equals three. So when systems work together, they give you better response than if they work uh, separately. So uh, what we do from the orthomolecular approach is we uh, look at diet and supplements. We also look at things like exercise, emotional, spiritual um, components, and uh, that is how we get up to the optimal health range. So what makes optimal health? What is it? It kind of looks like this. Uh, digestion is really important. You have to have good digestion. Uh, you have to be eating uh, good food actual food, real food, um, and getting the nutrients from the food. Um, exercise is important. Everybody talks about it. Um, you don't have to be an exercise fanatic, but you do have to move your body. Um, many systems are impacted by exercise. Uh, getting good sleep is important too. You know, a lot of people will function on seven hours, but the research shows that nine hours is optimal for most people. That's what they actually need. So most people don't do that. Uh, stress or stress management is actually important. Um, the ability to handle 
stress and be exposed to stressors and have resiliency to ride through it um, is required for optimal health. Uh, toxins or actually avoidance of toxins is required. Uh, there's a spiritual uh, component. So uh, um, we are spiritual beings and uh, that seems to be important for humans. Now the other column there, we have structure and function. Um, these are, we have to have proper structure, or structure and function of the systems in the body. Inflammation is, uh, it's actually a beneficial tool. We wouldn't have it um, if it wasn't important. And we use it, but the problem is when we use it too much or we fail to turn it off you know, or it's triggered inappropriately. So managing that's important. Uh, blood sugar balance. Um, we uh, eat several hundred times more sugar as glucose or other sugars uh, or starches as our great, 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 great ancestors did. And we have not evolved genetically fast enough to adapt to that. So there's ramifications. The immune system needs to be functioning properly, so not under-functioning and not over-functioning. We need to detoxify uh, not only things from the environment, but things that uh, are made by the body, uh, just normal metabolic um, residues and things like that. Uh, endocrine balance, so the balance of hormones, communications, and things like that is important. And then mental health. I mean, if you don't have mental health, the rest of it doesn't really matter, um, but that is a big component. So some of the takeaways here is digestion influences all the things on the right column there. And food and nutrients affect all of those things and exercise affects all of them sleep affects stress toxins so everything affects everything else and then everything like the structure and inflammation all of that influences everything else so there is no one cause for anything um, typically there will be many many causes and sub causes so how do we address the key issues with digestion? We need nutrients. And so I'm going to talk a lot about nutrients today because that is kind of the foundation ground um, level where everything happens. For proper digestion, you need vitamins. You actually need them. You need minerals. You need fiber to move things through. Uh, water, because uh, the contents of the digestive tract are, need to be fluid, and then fiber uh, will bind things and pull them out, but you need the water to make like a gel-like substance for most of the journey through the digestive tract. We also have uh, probiotics. Probiotics are good bacteria. We uh, will uh, uptake good bacteria from our mother when we are born and breastfed, and we establish colonies, and, and then later we get them from our foods. Uh, probiotics uh, modulate a lot of things in the body. We actually share DNA with our bacteria culture. And so if you have good bacteria, you're going to be sharing good DNA. And if you have bad bacteria, you're going to be sharing bad DNA. Um, food and nutrients kind of goes like this. This is a periodic table. There is roughly 24 to 26, depending on how you count, um, elements that are very important for the human body. Uh, there's lots of micro ones we don't talk about, but there's generally 24 to 26. And those are made into a bunch of nutrients that we call essential. So we have the vitamins, there's a list there. Uh, vitamins by definition are essential, which means the body cannot make them. We have minerals, which we cannot, are, that cannot be made by the body. We have to have those, those are the key ones. Uh, there's two fatty acids that uh, the human body cannot make, um, linoleic acid and linolenic acid. So the omega-3 and the omega-6, these are not the fish oils. We can make the fish oil, DHA and EPA from uh, the uh, omega-3 linolenic acid. We also have a, a slew of uh, amino acids, and depending on how you count, there's either eight or nine essential ones, the rest we can make. Um, but altogether, uh, depending on how you, how you count these, we have roughly 40 to 42 essential nutrients that the body requires. If you take out any one of these, you will die. So why is that? Because we use these molecules, we use the nutrients to make molecules. Uh, that would be vitamin C there. Um, and we take those molecules and we build them into substances and then we take the substances and we do something like this, which is just a small subset of the 
uh, metabolic reactions that go on the body. So we have about 40, 42 essential nutrients that get built into uh, about 10 million unique substances. So a deficiency in one area is going to show up in a lot of places in the body, which will then impact other places and other things down the road. So uh, for food and nutrients, we need protein, fats, and carbohydrates. These are the uh, macronutrients, the ones we need in large, relatively large amounts. We have vitamins and minerals, which are micronutrients, which we need in smaller amounts. Uh, we have molecules called antioxidants, which I'm going to talk about coming up, and fatty acids, probiotics, and fibers. So these are the things we need to get. Uh, exercise is important for us, but we need some things. We need antioxidants because exercise generates free radicals. And uh, so uh, a lot of people don't like free radicals, they're actually bad for us. But when we have our antioxidants, it's just part of the system. We can count for them properly. Uh, fuel, so um, we can burn glucose or starches made into or broken down to glucose, but we can also burn protein and fat for fuel during exercise. And then there's the protein for building muscles and you know, a few other things like that. Uh, for sleep, we need an optimal diet. We actually need um, just as much nutrition to sleep. So the brain needs just as much to sleep as it does during the day. And so a lot of times people can't sleep and it's because they don't have the nutrients that are required to allow good sleep. Um, so optimal diet would be a good place to start, but magnesium is very calming to the muscles and certain aspects of the stress management system and definitely in the brain. Uh, tryptophan is an amino acid, but it gets made into 5-HTP oh, and then serotonin. And serotonin is, gives us the calm and blissful um, feeling, but serotonin in the dark at nighttime gives us melatonin, which is one of the molecules that regulates uh, the proper sleep cycle. Uh, for stress, stress requires vitamin C, magnesium. Both of those are required by the adrenals to make uh, uh, cortisol and epinephrine. And uh, so they uh, are useful there. Vitamin C is also useful in the brain. It's used to make serotonin. It's also used to make dopamine. And uh, B vitamins show up throughout the brain and the stress management system, especially vitamin B6. Uh, there are several, several amino acids like tyrosine and tryptophan that are used to manage stress as well. Uh, talking about toxins, I do the uh, clinical detox continuing ed course, and these are some slides from that one. Um, the, uh, this is just to show you where some of our toxic load is coming from. Um, if you look at the processed food segment or section of the supermarket, uh, every one of these things that is shown there uh, is containing artificial ingredients, ingredients that are not food, and they are there not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the manufacturers. Any molecule that is not food needs to be detoxified. And so these are very low in nutrition and have molecules that need to be detoxified. If you go to the grocery section, you see the fruit and the vegetables there. Um, if they are conventional, they will most likely have pesticide residues, small amounts or large amounts, depending on the food. Uh, we have dairy products and meat, which might contain hormones and the cheddar cheese, cheddar cheese is not actually orange, so it has dyes in it. And then we have salmon there, and some of the residues in salmon would include potentially, uh, well, farmed will have uh, um, all kinds of environmental toxins and hormones and heavy metals and things like that. Uh, when we cook food, even if we start with good food, we can cook it and increase its toxic load in several ways. So uh, frying does it, boiling does it, storing things in aluminum or cooking aluminum. Um, baking bread generate so called advanced glycation end, uh, end products. And uh, Teflon outgasses into the food for several years. And uh, yeah, that's enough bad news there. Uh, this is where most women will get most of their toxic load in their lifetime. It will be from the products that they put on their skin. So if you put a product on your skin and it has things like phthalates or other molecules, colors or uh, fragrances, those molecules get absorbed into the skin. They go into blood circulation. They go to the liver and the liver has to detox them. And when, every time you detox a molecule, you need nutrients to uh, counter that. Uh, the 
more and more places where we get our toxic load. So uh, to uh, address the toxins for detox, we need vitamins and minerals at all steps, and we actually need all of them to do the job of detoxification. We need protein. Uh, protein is used for enzymes, but it's also used to bind heavy metals and certain uh, um, toxic uh, molecules. Uh, phytonutrients are, uh, we could describe them as the colored um, components of plants. Uh, they are, phyto means plant, nutrients, nutrient. And uh, the body uses these for lots of different roles. Antioxidants uses it for uh, upregulating detoxification. Uh, once we've detoxed molecules, we have to get rid of them. And usually they, if they're fat soluble, which is most of the environmental toxins, they have to be bound. So they get dumped into the uh, GI tract. And if we have enough fiber and enough water to make a gel, we will bind up those toxins and eliminate them. Uh, probiotics as well are important for uh, detoxification. Uh, good bacteria actually detox uh, a large chunk of toxins that are actually inside the GI tract uh, when they come in on the food, but they also help uh, detox and keep uh, molecules detoxed, we'll say, in the GI tract after they've been detoxified. Uh, for the spiritual component, um, it kind of goes like this. You either need all of the nutrients to be 100% spiritual and get the mind-body energy uh, realm going, or you don't need any of them. Um, I have seen people who are master healers, spiritual healers, who uh, don't eat very well, um, and so they can do it. But I do wonder if they would be way better if they had their body where it needs to be with all the nutrients. A few things that are also important to consider. Uh, things that affect the body and affect the health long-term are things like trauma, and that could be physical trauma or mental and emotional trauma, uh, pathogens like running into parasites and uh, things like candida. And then there's inherent weaknesses. Everybody has inherent weaknesses. Um, some affect people more than others, but all of those have to be considered if we're gonna take people from good health to optimal health. So I'm gonna just cover a few of the most important nutrients, um, kind of just uh, random, well, not randomly, but selectively picked a few to talk about. Um, first, we're gonna talk about the antioxidants. So antioxidants are molecules that donate electrons to molecules that are missing. Um, problem, molecules that are missing electrons are called free radicals. And the problem with them is if you take an electron away, the molecule is now positive or more positive. Nature doesn't like positive or negative. It likes to balance it. So the free radical will steal the electrons from the body. And when you take an electron from the body, the part of the body that had the electron now becomes imbalanced and it doesn't function properly. So uh, there are some of the sources of free radicals and some of the key antioxidants are vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and zinc and selenium. And so the key antioxidants that we get from food are vitamin A, vitamin E, C, and then beta carotene. Um, all of those are good electron donators. A little bit on vitamin A. Uh, vitamin A is required for mucosal membranes. So the, any place in the body where you have saliva or mucus, so like the digestive tract, the eyes, the sinuses, the nose, the lungs, uh, vitamin A helps keep that mucous membrane um, functional and uh, satisfactory. Uh, vitamin A is required for growth and healing. We need it for eyesight. And uh, vitamin A is required um, by the immune system. And uh, so food sources, animal products only. So we cannot get vitamin A from anywhere except animals. Um, we can create it from beta carotene um, if we have enough of the other nutrients that are required along the way. Now, vitamin E protects fatty acids in the body. So uh, we're going to do vitamin C in a second, but vitamin E is the main antioxidant in fat soluble locations like reproductive tissue, endocrine tissue, the brain, thyroid, and uh, actually the fatty acid wrapper. So the wrap around every cell is uh, protected by vitamin E. Uh, vitamin E reduces cancer risk largely because it's an antioxidant and reduces cardiovascular stroke um, issues largely because it's an antioxidant. There's a study that was uh, published in the American General Journal of Clinical Nutrition, vitamin E status, they looked at almost 30,000 Finnish men for 19 years, 
those who have the highest blood levels of vitamin E have lower to total mortality and cardiovascular disease. Vitamin C, which is my favorite all-time nutrient, um, and here is why, because it's antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. You need to make collagen, which is required. Uh, it's a backbone for hair, skin, nail, and bones. Vitamin C, as vitamin C, acts as antihistamine. It's also directly anti-inflammatory. We need it for detoxification. It helps manage stress, and it's anti-cancer. So um, if you had to only if you could only use one nutrient, this would be it, hands down. And the food sources, fresh fruit and vegetables are the key places to get it. The body makes antioxidants as well. And so the two main ones are glutathione and something called SOD, superoxide dismutase. The body uses vitamins and minerals to make the antioxidants that it makes itself. And there's the list of them there. You talk about fatty acids. So fatty acids can be saturated or unsaturated. So saturated fatty acids have a carbon backbone and there is hydrogen, at bind, two bind, uh, hydrogens binding every carbon in the backbone. The unsaturated have some places where the, there are no hydrogens at the, the carbons. And what that does is it creates what's called a double bond. It takes a while to explain what double bonds are, but I will just say that double bonds allow the fatty acid to bend and that imparts functionality to the fatty acid. And uh, I kind of teach it like this, uh, there is no life on this planet without unsaturated fatty acid, it is essential. Uh, the EFAs are the two linoleic and alpha linoleic uh, acids um, and we use those to make the EPA and DHA that you get from fish oil. And uh, so there we go. Uh, this is a diagram of phospholipid and the phospholipids are used to make cell membranes. There is a saturated fatty acid that gives structure to the molecule and an unsaturated fatty acid, which we will say gives functionality to the molecule. Uh, there's a glycerol backbone, which is actually, let's we'll say, a sugar. And then there is a phosphorus head that uh, uh, helps make one end the fatty acid and like fat and the other end like water. So we take the fatty acids, uh, on the left is just a representation, that's how we draw these phospholipids. They get lined up to build cell membranes and the diagram on the right is the cell membrane. So those blue little uh, ball-like things are the phospholipid heads and inside the sandwich we'll say are the fatty acids. The yellow things there are actually cholesterol. Cholesterol is very important for cell membranes. It provides function and Action. So there's the fatty acids. It accounts for about 60% of the wrap around every cell in the body. Your, the way your cell behaves is dependent on the fatty acids you load into the cell membrane. So some of the roles of fatty acids, oxygen transfer uh, in and out of the cell, very important for that. Um, parts of the membrane I kind of showed you. Uh, membrane fluidity. So we do not want a solid type membrane. It has to have some fluidity so we can allow things to diffuse in like oxygen and minerals and things like that. Uh, some of the fatty acids get built in the messengers and hemoglobin. So the things that carries um, oxygen around the blood uh, requires fatty acids for production. Uh, in order to do cell division, you need fat, um, fatty acids and DNA the structure has fatty acids in it and then neurotransmitters to function properly. Uh, food sources for the omega-6, so we need omega-6 to omega-3, uh, roughly in a 3 to 1 or 2 to 1 ratio. So we need more 6 to 3. Um, but that ratio I am talking about strictly the oils in their undamaged state, so fresh oils from nuts and seeds. We're eating them um, for the omega-6. And the omega-3, flaxseed, chaseed, walnuts, all good sources of um, that fatty acid. And for EPA and DHA, which we can make, but we don't make uh, in sufficient quantities, most of us, uh, we get from our diet and cold water fish, and there's some examples of that. Very good sources. I'd like to talk about methyl donators for a second, um, because the uh, methyl donators are hugely important, and they show up in a lot of illness and uh, disease. Uh, methyl group is a carbon and three hydrogens, 
and uh, we use those to turn things on, turn things off, and uh, many, many other roles. We do about 20,000 methylation reactions per second per cell, so pretty important. This is a uh, simplified diagram of what the methylation cycle looks at, and uh, it's really the important part is the folate that goes in, but just to the right of this methionine, and methionine is an amino acid that donates methyl groups. And when it donates methyl groups, it does a bunch of roles. And so we'll kind of show how what happens. So when we donate the methyl groups, we can activate DNA, RNA, turn on neurotransmitters, turn off neurotransmitters, um, protein metabolism, all kinds of things. Once we've donated the methyl group, we end up with homocysteine at the bottom of that cycle. And we use the homocysteine to make glutathione, which is one of the most protective molecules. Uh, but the homocysteine, not all of it goes to glutathione. Some of it has to go back to methionine because homocysteine is toxic to arteries and capillaries. So what we do is we add the methyl group back with vitamin B12 and folate. And those are two methyl donators. If you follow the, say the gear is over, the uh, second gear from the left is where we activate serotonin and dopamine, so calm and blissful and focus and attention and happiness. And then that gear intersects with the energy production. So if you stop one gear, you stop them all. If you slow down one gear, you slow them all down. Um, so the key methyl donator, it's our folate, B12, choline, and something called betaine or trimethylglycine. Uh, this is a somewhat more complex diagram of the whole uh, um, methylation cycle. And the reason I'm showing you this, um, you can see methionine there at the top uh, right, um, that cycle there, and the THF on the cycle to the left of it, that THF is tetrahydrofolate, that is the folic acid or folate that we get from food. And so basically, if you study this, you'll see that everything's connected to everything else. I'm just going to show you here where folate and B12, choline, and betaine fit into that cycle. So these nutrients are essential for methylation, and methylation is essential for life and health. So uh, I just talked about all those uh, roles right there, um, except for the epigenetic modulation. Uh, we have genes that are for our benefit and ones that are not for our benefit. And one of the ways that we decide which ones we're going to go with are with the methyl donators. And so we can turn on genes that are for our benefit and turn off ones that are not. And I think I got a few minutes here, so I will uh, um, just move on through here. So the, I am very passionate about brain health and it turns out that methyl donators are very important for the way the brain works. Uh, you need it for neurotransmitters to make them, break them down, balance them. You need it to make nerve cells, and you need them to protect the brain from damage. B12 is another important uh, um, molecule in the brain. And keep going. There's the food sources, so beans, legumes, dark leafy greens, so make sure you eat those guys. And uh, B12 only comes from animal products um, and some algae, so you can get the sources there. And I think I am just going to skip down a few slides to show you how we wrap this up. Right here. So foods for optimal health, fresh fruit and vegetables, and it should actually be vegetables and fruit because we need more of those, less fruit. Uh, five to eight servings a day. Nuts and seeds give us a lot of the antioxidants and good oils. We have nuts and seeds is beneficial. Vitamin or uh, olive oil is very good for us. Beans and green leafy vegetables give us some methyl donators. Uh, sea veggies or green drinks uh, very beneficial for some of the minerals. The uh, Mediterranean diet has been shown over and over and over again to promote optimal health. There is literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies that show that. Ideally, if you're building your food composition uh, or your plate composition, you want roughly one-eighth uh, protein, one-eighth starch, and three-quarters uh, non-starchy veggies, and a good oil to capture things off. And uh, of course, you want to avoid anything that's toxic. And I think that is just about enough. Thank you so much, Paul. That was fantastic.
So I think your, um, your clinical detoxification course is coming up in 2020, right? It is, it is. Okay, at the Mississauga campus? Yes, and it's a three-day weekend. Excellent. So if anyone is interested in, in catching Paul in his clinical detoxification course at IHN, uh, we'd love to see you there. And thank you so much, Paul, for your uh, wonderful lecture this evening. All right, thank you. Okay, so our final speaker, we have uh, Jamie Lynn Shaw. And Jamie received her Bachelor of Health Science from the University of Western Ontario. Jamie is also a graduate of IHN. She is a certified nutritional practitioner and graduated in 2013 with first class honors from the IHN Toronto campus. Uh, Jamie resides and works in the Ottawa area. She is the founder of Jamie Lynn Shaw, where she started her career working online through her website, building nutrition protocols to help her clients renew and reclaim their health. Jamie works with clients worldwide and has also uh, has office uh, space in her Ottawa area, area where she runs a, a wonderful, busy and successful practice there. She is the head nutritionist at Statera, which is an Ottawa-based supplement company that focuses on nutritional neuroscience research and development. She is also uh, the head nutritionist at Koru Nutrition, specializing in working with clients who have suffered brain injuries and motor vehicle accidents. Jamie is also a personal trainer and works with clients towards their health and fitness goals, optimizing their nutrition and also training plans. Jamie is a faculty member at the IHN Ottawa campus where she teaches professional practice, comparative diets, nutrition and health with fundamentals. She is also one of our student clinic advisors at the Ottawa campus. Let's welcome Jamie. Hi everyone, thanks so much for the introduction, Elizabeth. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Okay, everyone can see that okay? Okay, thank you so much for everyone showing up tonight. Um, and again, thanks for the introduction, Elizabeth. So tonight I am going to talk about the elusive diet, fact or myth. So I'm pulling from the course Comparative Diets. So if anyone does have any questions after tonight's webinar, feel free to email me or reach out and I will get in touch. Okay, so a few things that we are going to cover tonight. We're quickly going to touch on Canada's Food Guide. We're going to talk about a few trending diets. So specifically, the ketogenic diet as it is extremely popular right now. We're going to touch on high protein diets. We're going to talk about the paleo diet and vegan and vegetarian diets, as well as what is the perfect diet for you. So as much as we all want this nice clear cut answer, what is the best diet for me? Unfortunately, there's no one size fits all approach. So every single person has a different predisposition meaning everyone has a different ideal diet that is going to bring them to optimal health. So one of our jobs as nutritionists is to be educated on all the scientific research behind all of these diets, and then to work with our clients and put our detective hats on, dig a little bit deeper, find the root cause to the symptoms that they are experiencing, and work together to find the ideal diet for them that is going to make them thrive. So yes, there are so many different diets out there. It almost feels like every month there's a new diet popping onto the scene, but because of time, we aren't going to be able to touch on all of them tonight, but these are the ones that we are going to talk about. Okay. I love this quote. So symptoms are not enemies to be destroyed, but sacred messengers who encourage us to take better care of ourselves. So what this quote is saying is that we need to listen to our bodies. Our bodies are extremely smart and communicate with our mind by triggering symptoms to tell us that something's not right. So we try and shut down these symptoms and ignore them. But it, again, it's our body trying to tell us something. We need to make changes. So the goal of holistic nutritionists is to empower and educate the client to improve their overall health, specifically with nutrient dense foods, natural supplementation, 
detoxification, and lifestyle recommendations. So we're helping people find the diet that is going to make them thrive. Okay, so just quickly looking at the new Canada Food Guide. So yes, there have been some great positive changes that just recently came out, but just looking at this, think to yourself, can this be the one specific diet that is perfect for 36 million Canadians out there? No. So again, we are all very different, something called bio-individuality. So a diet that works for me and makes me feel great may make the next person feel terrible. So it actually goes as far as what makes me feel great today may be completely different five years down the road. So we need to listen to our body again and adapt to it. I think that this is a great starting point. One thing that I do with all of my clients is I always ask them to picture their plates. So it's a good way to get them to picture their macronutrients and divide their, their plates up. So it is a great starting point. Okay, so the ketogenic diet, the infamous keto diet. So I'm sure many of you have heard about this in the media. It definitely is trending right now and is a very hot topic. I'm sure many of you listening today have may even attempted this before. So the ketogenic diet is a term for a low carbohydrate diet. So very similar to the Atkins diet. The majority of the diet consists of fat and then is followed by protein and then very minimal amounts of carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates are kept around 30 to 50 grams per day. Just to put things into perspective, one single banana has 23 grams of carbohydrates. So it's not very much. So by eating this way, your body starts to burn fat stores for fuel rather than glycogen stored in muscles. So when your body begins burning fat for fuel, the fat cells begin releasing something called fatty acids, which your liver will then break down to produce what are called ketones. So ketosis by definition. So basically the overall goal of ketosis is to switch your body's fuel source from glucose to fat. So sometimes this can be a tricky transition because our body is so used to burning glucose for fuel, that's what they want to do. So this transition period is usually known as the keto flu, where you'll experience symptoms like brain fog and low energy, just to name a few. So here's a nice appetizing keto salad. Okay, so the nitty gritty science of it all. So you will often hear people say that our bodies cannot survive without carbs, but thanks to a process called gluconeogenesis, this is not the case. So this is when our bodies can generate glucose from non-carbohydrate substances. For example, the breakdown of protein. So this is a very beneficial process. When following the keto diet, it is very important to pay attention to your macronutrients because the majority of your diet does have to come from fat. And this is one mistake a lot of people make is it's much easier to eat a diet that's rich in protein, but this is following more of the Atkins diet versus the ketogenic diet. Okay, so this diagram is showing you a breakdown of the macronutrient components for the ketogenic diet. So a, roughly five to 10% of your diet is going to come from carbohydrates. Again, not very much. 20 to 25% is coming from protein and 70 to 80% is coming fat, from fat, which is a big change from the standard American diet. So just to put things into perspective, the standard American diet is roughly 65% carbohydrates, 20% protein and 15% fat. So just looking at this diagram, you see that it's talking about the macronutrient breakdown, but nowhere does it say anything about the quality of these macronutrients. So that is why the ketogenic diet can sometimes get a bad rap. It's what I call, what we see in the media, the dirty keto, where you're not looking at the quality. I prefer to use the clean keto, where you are still paying attention to the quality of the macronutrients, to make sure that you're getting 
proper micronutrients as well. Okay, so yes, weight loss is a huge side effect of the ketogenic diet and usually the only one that we actually hear about. But there are many other benefits to the ketogenic as well. So a couple of them being blood sugar balance, candidiasis, increased energy, decreased brain fog. So that's a huge benefit as well. The ketogenic diet is also known for seizure control. So the keto diet isn't a new thing, even though it's recently come back into the media, it's been around for a long time. So this diet has been in use since the 1920s at the John Hopkins Epilepsy Center. So there's actually a fairly recent study where they took 73 children and assigned a ketogenic diet, and then 72 other children ate a regular diet. So after roughly three months, those on the ketogenic diet had fewer seizures and some were even seizure free, which is amazing. Okay, so question. Is the goal of the ketogenic diet to put an individual in long-term state of ketosis? So this is a question that I get all of the time. So if you transition into a ketogenic diet, are, do you have to stay on this long-term because it may not seem sustainable? So if it, you are on the ketogenic diet for disease management, then yes, then you may have to be in mild ketosis long-term for things like epilepsy. If it's specifically for weight management, then no. So the approach that I use for myself or with clients is something called cyclical ketosis where you may cycle on and off the ketogenic a few times a year, depending on your goals. So with me specifically, I may go into ketosis for six weeks. Once I reach my goals, come out, still eat a healthy lifestyle. And then when I feel like going back on, I just transition back on. I'm sure you have lots of questions about the ketogenic diet, but we are going to move on and discuss a high protein diet. So we're going to talk about the paleo diet. So this is another very, very popular diet that many people follow. So the paleo diet is sometimes actually referred to the CrossFit diet because it's very popular in CrossFit gyms. So this diet restricts all foods that were not present in the human diet prior to the agricultural revolution. So this became popular when the paleo diet book was released in 2002 and the term paleo first surfaced. So like most diets, this diet was first marketed as a weight loss diet. Okay, so this diet approach differs from the ketogenic diet, mainly with the fat content. So the paleo diet focuses on lean protein. The paleo theory is that lectin containing foods, so these are things like legumes, beans, pulses, they were not around before the agricultural revolution, so that means that we should not be consuming them. So lectins are a plant's defense mechanism to keep predators away. This is actually a type of protein that's found in many plant foods, and this can cause damage to the lining of our gastrointestinal tract or organs, and in turn can interfere with metabolism when consumed in large amounts. So this can, down the road, lead to things like leaky gut. So by cutting out these foods, you will experience different side effects like weight loss, increased metabolism, reduced appetite, and improved insulin sensitivity. This diagram is showing you the paleo food pyramid. So you can see on the bottom that the majority of your diet is coming from protein. So meat, eggs, fish. Moving up, still a big portion of this diet is coming from vegetables, a small amount of fruits, and then a very small amount of nuts. So the seven key principles of the paleo diet. So you're getting your carbohydrates from vegetables and fruit. 
you're consuming a lot of protein, but you're looking at quality of protein. So free range, grass fed animal sources. Focusing on healthy fats, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, so omega-3 and 6, and you're looking at less saturated fats. High amounts of fiber from non-starchy vegetables and fruits, and foods high in potassium and low in sodium. The goal of the paleo diet is to be in a net alkaline load, and you're going to choose foods that are rich in phytochemicals, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. Okay, so that being said, what is forbidden on the paleo diet? So things that you are not allowed to eat. We have packaged and processed foods, dairy products, cereal grains, legumes, starchy vegetables, cured meats, pickled foods, and many condiments. So at first glance, this list may seem very overwhelming because it's a lot of food that we're cutting out, but there's still a ton that we can eat. So the main focus being on quality of food to maximize nutrient consumption, which is a huge improvement from the standard American diet. So there are many pros and cons to the paleo diet. So a few pros just to pick out some high vegetable consumption, which is always better. The fact that you're paying attention to the quality of food is great. So again, grass fed, free range meat, weight loss, huge side effect. You're eliminating white refined carbohydrates. A few cons of the paleo diet can be it's a one size fits all approach. So you're given the foods that you can eat and the foods that you must eliminate. And it's not looking at the individual or their bio individuality. The paleo diet follows an 85 15 rule, which is encouraged for weight loss. So it's fairly strict, meaning you have to follow this diet 85% of the time and people may find this hard to follow. Also, this diet approach doesn't work for people with aversions to animal foods. Okay, so now we will touch on vegetarian and vegan diets. So there are many different versions of vegetarian and vegan diets. So we're going to go over these briefly. So we have the broad American diet, this is also known as the standard American diet minus animal protein. So still not looking at the quality of food, you're not giving up flour and sugar. It's still very unbalanced and fattening. Then we have the natural vegetarian, also known as the lacto-ovo. So this goes one step further and you're now eliminating frozen and canned foods, white flour, and sugar. So big step up from the standard American diet. Then we have lactarian. So on top of these things, it also forbids eggs. Then we have the fruitarian diet. So this became popularized by Steve Jobs. So this diet, you can only consume fruits, nuts, and raw vegetables. Some soaked grains, but not all. So this may be a good cleansing or detox diet, but it's not sustainable long-term because it is very breakdown. Then we have the standard vegan diet, which forbids all animal products and sometimes even includes honey. Okay, so studies have shown many positive benefits of following a vegetarian or a vegan diet. So according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the following are very beneficial from following this diet. So heart disease, colorectal, ovarian, and breast cancers, it benefits diabetes, reduces risk of obesity, and hypertension is very good for the environment ethical considerations and economical considerations as well. So many positives. 
So like most diets out there, it's so important to be educated on the proper way to follow this eating style. So protein deficiency is a major health concern, which can cause symptoms such as hair loss, slow wound healing, impaired vision, immune suppression, can affect negatively affect our digestive system, specifically our digestive enzymes. If this goes on too long, it can lead to other vitamin and mineral deficiencies, such as iron being a big one, B12, vitamin D, calcium, and zinc. Thankfully, we can get protein from many plant-based foods. So these are, this is just a list of a few plant-based foods that are packed full of protein. So we have things like hemp seeds and chia seeds, almond butter, flaxseed, chickpeas, almonds. So that being said, there are two types of protein. So we have a complete protein. This is a protein that contains all nine essential amino acids, which are the amino acids that we must get from food. Whereas incomplete proteins, on the other hand, can provide some, but not all of the essential amino acids. This doesn't mean that you have to eat foods that contain all nine essential amino acids all the time. Thankfully, our body can pool amino acids. So our body can pool amino acids for up to roughly 24 hours. So just to give you some examples of complete proteins. So we have cheese, fish, meat, and eggs. So these contain all nine essential amino acids. And then we have a list of incomplete proteins. So this is beans and legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. These are the plant-based foods that you can combine together to get complete proteins. So these combinations will give you all nine essential amino acids. So mixing your grains with legumes, legumes with nuts, grains and dairy, and legumes and seeds. Okay, so now as we went through the following slides, I'm sure many of you were intrigued by a few of the different diets that we touched on tonight. And some may have piqued your interest. And I wish I had a crystal ball that could tell me the ideal diet for all of you, but unfortunately I don't. So we as humans are very unique creatures and everyone is different. So everyone is going to have a different ideal diet. So this may seem very simple, but I cannot recommend this approach enough. So the good old fashioned food mood diary. So we are rushing through every single day. So we're eating while we drive, we're eating in front of the TV, we're barely chewing our food. We rarely sit down at a table to slow down and eat a meal. So because of that, we're not able to connect the dots between our symptoms and what we're eating, so our diet. So we don't know, is that headache from dehydration? Is it from lack of sleep? Could it be from the sugar or the chocolate bar that we just ate? So likely you have no idea because we just aren't taking the time to slow down and connect the dots. So this is something I make every client track. So I make them track at least five days of a food mood diary. I even do this every few months. It's very eye-opening. So not only does it allow you to get a good look into the person's or yourself um, diet habits, but you can see the foods that you're craving. So you can connect that 2 p.m. slump every day to a carbohydrate rich lunch. So again, are you drinking enough water? No, okay, that may explain constipation. How much stress are you under? Are you exercising? How many bowel movements are you having a day? So I know no one wants to talk about this, but it really helps give a clear picture of what's going on inside. So this little sheet of paper, again, can seem so simple, but it can really open your eyes uh, to what is going on. So I literally can't recommend this enough. 
I know there are many apps out there like MyFitnessPal and Chronometer and things like that, which are great to get a bit more specific and see that macronutrient breakdown. But I find personally and with clients that I get a lot more information when I make them write it out. So something I highly suggest you do. So the bottom line is there is no magic pill, no special shake, and no special diet. So everyone is very unique. A different diet is going to work for every single person. A step further is what, again, is going to work for you today, may evolve and not work for you a few years down the road. So you need to listen to your body and pay attention to the symptoms and the changes that are going on. Put on your detective hat, do a little bit of research, find out what diet intrigues you, the pros and the cons, and it's all about trial and error. So listen to your body. Thank you very much for coming. And if anyone has any questions, again, here is where you can contact me and yeah, email me any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was incredible. Oh, we appreciate welcome. your your insight on the uh, the diets that you did cover. Thank you so much. We'd like, yeah, we'd like to thank all of the participants that uh, were with us this evening. We hope you enjoyed uh, the speakers and the information. We'd love to see you on campus. Our next semester is starting on Monday, January the 6th in 2020. And uh, we'd love to invite all of you to come to the campus, be a student for a day uh, next week, um, and or connect with us on our Facebook, Instagram, our website. Please send us uh, any way you'd like to connect with us. And uh, we do have a couple of minutes left here. If, is there any questions that anyone would like to ask? Okay, and thank you also to our facilitators, Melody and Julia, and the background crew as well. So thank you very much. Uh, the Toronto campus uh, is in the process of update, updating their DLI number, and uh, we should definitely have um, the opportunity to accept international students by mid-2020. Uh, the Vancouver campus uh, absolutely can accept international students uh, right now. So it's a great opportunity to study in the West Coast. And uh, if that is available to you, uh, we'd love to see you in Vancouver. And just see another question come in here. Um, it says here how many spots are available for the January 2020 semester. We do have spots available, so it is good to contact each campus that you are considering. Uh, we do register one uh, day group at every campus for the January semester. Our classes range anywhere from 25 to 30 students. Uh, it's a great way to get all your questions answered. It's a wonderful, intimate environment. We really like to connect with each student and make sure that the experience is, is optimal. And uh, we're so excited to, uh, to really honor and rejoice all the amazing graduates that we do have over the past 24 years. So we invite you all to go to our alumni profiles on our website and uh, really check out what our amazing graduates are doing so you can see the incredible variety that is available uh, to you uh, once you graduate from IHN. So we're uh, so happy to be of service uh, to the most beautiful souls on this planet. Okay, thank you everyone. Good night and we look forward to uh, connecting with you in the near future. Bye.